Mr. John Gray. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Institute of Black Imagination. First of all, such a great name. Um, IBI is amazing. And thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here, Dario. Uh, a pleasure, man. Um, I'm, I'm so ready for this conversation. Like I know it's the conversation I, I need uh, on today and for the rest of this year, for sure. Uh, but to begin, who would you like to dedicate today's conversation to? I want to dedicate this conversation to my niece, Samaya, um, who recently moved in with me. And we had a great conversation yesterday uh, and she challenged me and I was like, you know, sometimes we want to close our ears to the youth, like especially like when you're in a, when they're like your niece or like, you know, it's kind of like a parental type thing, but she came to me and she really opened my mind. So I'll, 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 I'll give it, I'll give this episode, I'll dedicate this episode to her about things I want to change about myself and how I live, so. Uh, Samaya? Yeah, Samaya, Samaya. She's All right, Samaya, this Which is, is a trip, you. like. I was her age when she was born, you know? Like, it's crazy. Well, you know what? What was that challenge? Well, she 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 lives with me, and she was like, look, I want to actually spend time. She's like, we always, everything's just in passing. You're always on the go. We mm. don't talk. And although, you know how <clears throat> teenage kids could be, especially girls, I'm like, you spend too much time in your room, like, you could come if you're doing work. You could come in the living room in the kitchen when other when other adults are out here working. Like if you're just cooped up in your room for twelve hours, you're not gonna see me. But I, it also mm. just made me think about how I grew up living with my mom. Like we didn't have a lot of dedicated time to just kick it. You know, I did my thing, she did mm. her thing, and then when we saw each other, we said hello, and, and you know what I mean. So it wasn't that type of thing. But I, as I would like to start fostering deeper relationships with family and stuff like that. Even even like women I've dated in the past, it's like they've they've had that like lack of the feeling of a lack of a deep connection. And I'm like, quality time is us sitting down watching TV because you know a brother be working harder. I just like to come to the crib and chill. Not mm. talk too much, not think too much, not get too deep, but it's it's, it's room for evolution and growth, so yeah, here's to fucking growing, man. Um, so let's actually start with the present. Like, what is popping off for you right now? Oh, so much. Right, we got our book coming. I'm gonna get up and grab it um, later. We got our book dropping in October. I just got my hands on the first like physical copy last week, and it, it's a probably the hardest thing I've done is work on this book. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I can speak for my partners if it's one of the hardest things they've worked on as a work project. I've had harder things in my life, but in terms of work, because it just keeps going. Like, it's like two years. It's just keeping I'm like, yo, fuck, when is this shit going to be done? But at the end, it's a very gratifying thing. And because it's such a work of the community, we have so many great collaborators. And yeah, I'm, I'm just very, and it's like almost like, oh, shit, this is real. Like when you, it's something you can hold in your hand that's going to outlive you. Yeah, and so you're referring to the Black Power Kitchen book Precise. that that has been pre-ordered. Uh, got my pre-ordered signed copy on deck. Oh, um, from the from the Lip Bar. Shout out to from the Lip Bar. Black you, owned the, things. <laughs> but like, I think this is a good place to start, man. Like, what? Why was this so challenging? I think. Because our project is, I'm so used to this project ex existing in like an abstract atmosphere where it's like constantly evolving and always fluid and, and, and ready to change. But like being able to translate the thoughts in my brain and the, like not just really solely focus on past work, but to really distill ghetto gastro and to eat those idea, a tool book that other people utilize from the very tangible, tactical making the recipe, but also just giving them some of the food for thought through the via the different interviews and conversations we have, like with the likes of Thelma Gold and Emery Douglas, Kimberly Drew, you know, contemporaries, elders, like like our our mothers first and foremost, like 
weaving that, and then, and then to create a singular voice from three people is also such a challenge, right? Because everybody has different ideas of what they want to say and the points they want to get across, so to be able to come, become collaborative and, and, and have a collective unified vision. And then just like the, the brass tacks of it, getting recipes tested, hitting artists for contributions, following up for those high-res TIFF files, you know about that. You know all about even just scheduling me for this podcast. Like like so trying to do that with like so many artists and just creatives and people with our type of brains is not is not easy. <laughs> but so. you mentioned you mentioned some names, um, you know, Thelma Golden, uh, who is the chief curator at the Studio Museum of Harlem, um, Kimberly Drew, who has actually been on this podcast as well. So for those listening, please go back and check uh, Kimberly Drew's episode out. Uh, curator, writer, uh, just social media maven. We'll put that in the show notes for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Emory Douglas, the legendary graphic designer, um, who is incredible, but these are names that like aren't usually in conversation with like foodstuffs. So I think that's a good that's a good segue into like like what is ghetto gastro, right? Like what is ghetto gastro? Well, um, I guess I guess it exists in two realms. Like we're a collective of chefs, food lovers that are based in the Bronx and, you know, we use food as a medium to tell stories. When someone answers that question in a hundred years, I want it to be less about the individuals and more about the ideology, like just a new school of thought, like empowerment within community using vehicles and um, like, like, like just black creativity have we all done, like using using the tools that we have to as a form of liberation and expression. So we just wanted to tap into that in the realm of food. And it's about nourishment, you know, food for thought and food for your vessel. So. And, and how did this concept even come to be? And how has it evolved over time? I mean, I think, you know, to, to be a creative, to be a founder, you know, it's one thing to get the spark right? Everyone has ideas of something that they think could be something, right? Yeah. But to bring that into the world and to manifest a group of individuals or enroll them also in that vision, and then that idea become physical through projects, through products, through activations, like how, how did this happen? It started with a failed fashion brand. Like I was working, working in, in the schmata business, and like had some minor successes. I think I just started it, like two or three years too late and two or three years too early. So it was like started in '07. Like after like this first streetwear boom, like you had brands like LRG, a bunch of brands just making a lot of paper. Um, I got into that, and the reason I got into fashion, I start from square one, was because I had been in the streets hustling and I caught a case and I was facing like a lot of time, like 10 to life when they first indicted me. And I bailed out and I was gonna retire from the streets that summer. Um, and I had thought that, all right, I could do t-shirts because I went to this Funk Mass Effects car show and I saw like cats that looked like they were from the suburbs that like the way I define streets in those days, they, they didn't represent that. And I'm like, hold on. They doing this thing called streetwear and like I'm really in these streets, like turning up, like making a name. I got I got ideas. I know some graphic designers. I got some paper, like, let, let's get this cracking. So but when I got caught, I really went full throttle because I was like, I was making so much money um trapping that nothing could really take me, take my eye off that ball. Like everything else was like a little idea or a pet project. But then when I got caught, I just decided to take harness all of that energy and time and resources to to fashion. So I went to FIT to also show two things, to show that I was an upstanding citizen to the judge, that I wasn't just going to get rearrested and just be out here wilding. Also, it was just so many girls at that school. <laughs> so I was like, oh, it's lit, you know? <laughs> so, so I pulled up, you know, just being honest. <laughs> 
So I pulled up and I did my thing and I realized the most valuable resources in the school were like the young creatives that were in there studying, doing their thing that I was able to break bread with. It was this girl named Kiyoka that I had gone to church with. She was in there. She introduced me to some great people. Um, and then the library, the library is just a great resource. It's like Mintel reports, Down and Marketing reports, Trend Research, Swatch Library, just like access to like get student discounts when you go into like Mood Fabrics and all, all, all of these things, you know? I mean, just being in, you know, when you're in, con- in the convening, when you're convening with other creators, it's just a magical energy. So the things I picked up and learned from that, I quickly applied to entrepreneurship. Cause me, like, my mother's the type, she wants to learn something. She goes to school and learns it. Like she wanted to learn how to cook. She she had two culinary degrees, right? Me, I'm like, I want to do food. I just start a business, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a, <laughs> and learn and learn through the ebbs and flows of, of figuring out that entrepreneurial pursuit. But from there, um, had some minor success, like sold a great accounts, like Jeffries, we were in, and, um, you know, you remember Jeffries on 14th Street. So he was in Jeffries with American Rag in LA, Bergdorf Goodman with the denim with I made with my partners, Robin um, and Luke um, from FIT. And then I had the t-shirts bubbling at Union downtown on Spring Street. We were in um, Fred Siegel out west. But at that time, pre-Instagram, you couldn't really go direct to consumer or build your brand hand to hand. It was really about stores like like getting your getting your getting your weight up through accounts through doors and 2008 hit that recession hit and cr- and crushed retail people didn't want to take chances on new brands you know so for us we just was like still trying to hum and keep it going and and hustle and the ironic thing was like so many people wanted to invest the idea in 07 but I was feeling myself because I had some money in the bank I was like nah nah we gonna build this thing up on our own and then then we'll come take your money when it's worth more. But then those people that had that money to invest and in ca- fashion such a capital intensive business is so cash heavy. You need to outlay a lot of money to make it work. And yeah, so I was just like figuring, that's like till 2011, I was just like scraping and grinding, trying to make this thing. I didn't really believe in it. Um, Cause it also just wasn't something that I had to do. Like, you know, sometimes in our creative pursuits it's because we have no choice, right? It's like, I was mm. born to do this. I thought fashion was cool because I thought I could make some paper. It was a good creative expression of like when I learned, like I like having ideas and seeing the tangible thing come from it. But I also had the rude awakening that the business is 10% creative and 90% logistics, operations, supply chain, you know, dealing with, 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 with buyers, like getting accounts receivables. And like, and that for me was not, not lit. I didn't have like that right hand that was like lo- that loves that work. So I was I had a I was dealing with like depression and like uncertainty for a few years in like that 2010 to 2012 space because so much of my hi- identity had been wrapped up around getting money and this, this is the first time in my life I didn't have any. And like since I was 15, I was financially independent, right? So so like trying to cope with being a in my mid twenties, like hold up, I had more bread when I was fifteen years old. Like, what the fuck is going on? I can't. My girl paying for dinners. Like, I'm, I'm I'm trying to figure it out, and I was just fell into depression, and I had to like crawl crawl out of it. But in that, I just did some soul searching. I'm like, yo, what do I really care about? Because that was really the existential crisis. Like, I didn't understand my purpose. Like, my purpose couldn't just be making money. I'm like, what do I enjoy? And because I kind of didn't have a, 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 I guess, a quote unquote normal adolescence of exploring things and, and doing things that like teenagers and kids do. I didn't, I didn't do that. I just, I was just lost. But then I had mm. this spark, the spark came to me and it was like, yo, it's food. Like, first of all, you did a clothing brand, but you think about how you spend your money, you're down to spend your last money on a bomb ass meal with friends versus like a Lon Vaughn sweater, right? Which was Lon Vaughn was hot at the time. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not dropping that paper on these Lon Von sneakers. Like you shitting me? Like nah, but we could go, we could go, we could go to cafeteria, we could go to um to like Balud or whatever it was it was hot at the time and, and and do it up, you know? So I was like, all right, food could be a thing. And then my buddy Les, he grew up in the same neighborhood as me. He was a chef. He had one shot. So I was like, all right, we could do some things, like we could get and I just had so many relationships in the creative spaces and I just saw there was a void. I was like, nobody's really doing anything cool with food. Like it's 
everybody's trying to make the coolest t-shirt, right? Or drop the coolest mixtape or do whatever. Like, but I'm like, there's energy in this realm for food where, where it's, I feel like it's being overlooked and there's not much of a new conversation around it. So, so we came together like that. And another friend had tried to get me to invest in his restaurant to keep it open. But I was like, eh, I don't know about the restaurant thing. Mm. But it had it had sparked the thought. And I woke up from a nap. I was in Dumbo in Brooklyn, and I woke up from a nap with the name Ghetto Gastro. And then we got rolling. Started doing house parties at my crib. And I was living in the West Village at the time. I had a little one-bedroom in Washington. Started doing dinners at the crib, just inviting honeys. And then, and then these 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 young women happen to be like models, actresses, PR girls, marketing execs, and then the word just started trickling, and then clients wanted to to pay us to do things, and you know, then we started securing a bag. But the the blessing at that time was that everybody besides me had like a full time gig to to pay their bills, so we didn't ever have to like do any corny shit for the sake of a dollar. Like we were able to really protect the brand in the early stages. And just like get get our value, like because we 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 could care less. It's not like we were dying to do a job for. I'm not going to throw any brands out, but it's just like all right, whatever, take it or leave it, you know. So that's how that that's the that's the genesis of Ghetto Gastro. Man, I I love this story. I love this story. One, um, I think. And thank you for sharing it. It's it's a journey that I think is so important to hear because at the genesis of it and even at the basis of it, it was just about following your passion as as kind of flippant and like kind of basic and basic not in a in a as a pejorative, but like wait, like this honey's here. Like like <laughs> Like, I'm going because there's some fine-ass women here, and I love to be around that shit. And sometimes that's all you need, right? Like, that was the magnet that would then open up this entire world for you, right, that you didn't yet have access to. Um, And then even, you know, being in that place of, like, depression and, like, darkness, which is you know, like you said, like an existential crisis where there is, um, where there is really just a chasm between who you had been and who you knew yourself to be. And it was like, how do I bridge that? Um, but what pulled you out of that was really, again, something very practical and simple. Like I just like to, I just like to eat. I love food. And then that opens up this entire other world, right? Because what we are now, almost ten years ten, now, ten, looking ten back, years in, ten years in, and it, it, what, what, yeah, it was basically a reverse engineering from what I wanted to spend my life doing. And I love traveling, and I love eating food. And most of the travel I do is centered around the food that we'll eat. So I'm like, all right, how do we make this the thing? You know, we like, all right, we're gonna create. A, a language with food that brings us around the world, you know. So that's that was that was the goal, and also black liberation with me. It's mm. crazy. I was thinking I was looking at my tattoos in the mirror the other day, and I'm like, yeah, I was 17, and I got like a red, black, and green, like Pan African continent of Africa tattoo riled big on my shoulder. I'm like, yeah, I've been about this, like, because I grew up in a revolutionary household. So even when I was like mimicking 50 Cent and his. All of his tattoos, when I started getting tattooed, I was like, yeah, I'm going big and getting covered. I was still bringing in that, like, black power narrative, you know, into into that expression. Man, tell me about this revolutionary household. So, How did yeah, that nah, shape you, you know, looking looking yeah. back now? And it was a subtle revolutionary thing. It wasn't, it wasn't like, like, strictly, like, like, super militant, but it's like, the books my mother gave me to read, like one of the first books was the autobiography of Malcolm X, another was like Asada. So, just like you're gonna you're gonna revolutionize a young mind when you, it, with that's their first bit of reading, and and mm. it, it was really through that, and even just thinking about the artworks that my grandmother had on the wall, like portraits of Malcolm X, portraits of, uh, of Martin, you know, Marcus Garvey, like having an understanding of of those things coming up, also just coming of age in Harlem, like 
um, going to church in Harlem and cutting church and just being on 125th Street, roaming with my boy Emmanuel, right? Like, you're just surrounded by, like, blackness in a different way. Um, so, so yeah, it's just, it's just a, natural, a natural part of the DNA. Yeah, um, and kind of, you were speaking a little bit earlier about um, brands. I want to come back to, like, this building of, like, the Ghetto Gastro. Um, you spoke about some brands um, that remained nameless, um, hmm. but you now work with several brands, right? You work with, um, you know, Crooks and Williams Sonoma. You've released Knives, like... Uh, I actually went to your site last week, and I was like, D- "Do I do I get the sauce? Do I get the the waffle mix?" Like, so what has that process been like in working with brands? Right, like I feel like there's a there's such a level of authenticity that you bring to space, right? But there is this this uh, back and forth that one does in working with brands and bringing products to market. What is that process like? Yeah, collaboration is difficult. I think the process mm. starts when you when you have something that you enjoy and, and an entity that you respect, and if it's a collaboration with the so the Crux thing was like Crux existed already. They were selling appliances at Macy's with a very New York point of view. We came in. I I look at it like almost like the Nike and Brand Jordan deal. So like Nike existed, but then Jordan came in and did his line of sneakers which he owns equity in the whole thing, right? And gets royalties, but it elevated all of Nike to be able for Nike to be what it is able to be. And that's how the crux deal works. So it's like a collaborative partnership. They handle the infrastructure, the manufacturing, dealing with the buyers, and we handle the design and, and the utilization and showing people how to use it and getting it popping in the streets. Um, but the, the, the CPG, the edible products, that's all us. So, mm-hmm. so that's like we own that, and it's a it's a it's a push and pull with the with the consumer, like seeing what people want because you have to guess. And the thing about CPG is that's challenging is like you can't just make a T-shirt graphic and not even print the T-shirt and slap it on the blink and put a graphic up online and let people respond to it. Like with food, you got to make a lot of it and hope they like it, you know, and then be mm. and, and iterate as you can. So it's been a learning with that, but yeah, just. When I think about the idea of scaling and getting past the niche things that we do, the way we get in the households is through the product. Like at our, at our set event, the most people that will ever probably be at something where they could taste our food that we're actually cooking with our hands is maybe 150, 200, 300 people at max. But we're trying to touch millions. So being able to like get, get the food into people's homes and on their plate and have them enjoy and break bread and dialogue that's that's the goal, you know. We want to be inclusive with a capital I versus exclusive with a capital E, you know. So trying to trying mm-hmm. to open it up. Yeah, but like you know, circle back to that phrase you said. Collaborations are tough. Oh like yeah, it's what, challenging. Like what? What is that? How does that even begin, right? Like you know, we've been in in several spaces and we've had you know several conversations, but you know, for for people listening, I think this is like. This is like the nitty gritty, right? Of what does it mean to even, so say a brand approaches you or maybe even you pitch a brand, right? With the Dex, say like, we'd love to do this with you. De- Dex equals checks type shit. <laughs> I mean, is that your strategy? Like what, well, like how, do you, how do you think about collaboration from the genesis our, through to the end? Our strategy is like, we, we, have, we don't do any outreach. That might change because of some things that we want to do. Everything is typically incoming. I think with us, and it might have been an ego thing, you know, it's like, no, let's build our thing to where, like, we're not, we not asking anybody to mess with us. They just come to us to mess with us. And that way we could be who we are, right? And we don't have to, like, compromise and fit into, fit into a mold. But even with that equity in, and, and like, 10 years in building, you, you still don't know what you don't know, right? Mm-hmm. And if you want to expand, someone told me, like, you can't, where you want to go, you won't get there doing what you've done. So the collaborative thing is new. Like, and just being able to, I think, look at what wins look like for all of the entities involved and just figure out creatively how you get there. But you are going to have to make some compromise. There are going to be some things that you don't agree with that you're like, all right, let's 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 try. 
And it's a two, it's a two, it's a two um, headed dragon. Cause sometimes the biggest lesson I've learned is like, don't go against my gut instinct and to, to, to listen to the experts. And then sometimes you'd be like, oh, all right, that was a good point. This did work differently. So it's like figuring out when to really just stick, stand, 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 stand on your, um, on your, I don't know what the, I don't know what the, what the, what the phrase would be, but just to really stand by your beliefs and your ideas versus like conceding and compromising. So it's a, it's a delicate balance and it's kind of like a roll of the dice. But my thing mm. is also, I don't want to do anything that compromises what we built and will have us lose, have the consumer or our audience lose trust in us. So that's why mm. I try to, I try to stay, stay true, but it's also, certain things that are quote unquote staying true that limit your appeal to, to reaching many people. So figuring out what you can sleep with at night, as long as you can sleep good at night about what you put out, I think that that's the key. Mm. You know, um, you know, and I'm sure a lot of these collaborations, you know, come through relationships, right? And I think, you know, relationships, relationships are, are the real wealth, you know, I think, I, I mean, even on the continent, relationships are seen as real wealth, not money. Um, what relationships have really, you know, what key relationships have really like shaped your trajectory? Wow. I would say it's funny. Um, the key, the key relationships, so many, um, mostly the friends that I've, I've had and developed, in my in my in like that early two thousands, like mm. two thousand eight, like late late two thousands, I guess it was two thousand eight to two thousand, like two thousand six, seven, eight, to to now, like people that a lot of people like to network up, right? Where they like they see someone that's where they want to be, and they're like, I need to get with that person. They're going to teach me, but it's really about looking at who's next to you, grinding, and. What y'all are going to be able to do together in three, four, five, ten years by where y'all are at in y'all careers is going to be what the game changer is. So I think it's like people being in position. And those are also the people that know what's dope. Like the people at the top, quote unquote top, are looking at what's happening in the streets and a few levels below so they can stay cool and stay relevant. So I think being able to just make sure you you bubble with who's next to you and rise up. But I say some key friendships and key supporters have been like my girl Cece. She's like my best friend. We were in the Allen Houston program together. My mother just sent me a picture of our my Allen Houston business diploma and I sent it to Cece. So Cece has enlightened me on so much. Like we used to both be super nerds and just sharing things all day, every day to each other. Um, my friend Nicole introduced us to Yaz. Yaz brought Ghetto Gas Show, our first paid gig even though we were thoroughly underpaid, but it was still dope to to get in, to, to to get that gig. It's it's crazy when you when you when you like how things change when you realize how much work it actually takes and how much things actually cost. But when you're young and hungry you just wanna get in the game. So mm -hmm. so uh, I would say those are some big relationships. My friend Lauren Carruthers who, you know, before the big bag started coming in, she was at Lauren Ralph Lauren. And she just gave us some like side catering gigs where we were doing like, um, what, what do they call that? Craft services, right? To oh couple, yeah, yeah, yeah. To get to get some bands in, like just to just to get that get some bands in, and it was Ralph. Like, and when you got a company like Ralph cutting the check to a company called Ghetto Gasho, that's just a real <laughs> a real a, assuring assuring thing. So, so I would those are, that's who comes to mind right now. Um, I think folks and foremost, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, because they just instilled such a confidence in me that honestly anything is possible. And without that, I probably wouldn't be have the ambition or the or the or the the um, my vocabulary is shitty today. But I just wouldn't have like the the drive or the like when I when I do something like it's not like if if this works it's like I right, when this works like it's just moving with a certain mm. type of gravitas towards like feeling like things can happen and I think within our community we've also we've been tricked for centuries like that what we think what we do what we what we what we offer is of lesser value and I feel like it's the maximum value it's like it's like a 
a value that you can't put a price on, you know? Mm, when did you learn that value? Well, I think I think I was just, it started in a restaurant, honestly. My first boost of confidence was, it was an older Jewish woman that used to be a regular at First Walk on 88th and 3rd Avenue. Um, when I was living in, I, I told, told the young lady earlier, when I was living in Metro North Houses, we used to frequent Upper East Side restaurants after my mom got off work because she didn't always have time to cook. So she'd get me from the after school program, she'd get off a job and then we'll go. And I was at the 92nd Street Y after school program, so a Jewish, a Jewish after school. So it was like, I've always had this mixed media kind of life. So we go, we go to First Walk and I remember this woman, I always remember her ordering lemon chicken. I just had a really sharp memory at that time. And I was like, the way I used to read the menu back in the days was like really, in the anthropological, like, like it was like an algorithm of what recipes worked. And I understood the algorithm in my head at like the age of six. And I told her, I was like, yeah, miss, you should get this. Like, actually, you get the lemon chicken, try the orange chicken. It's less bitter. You know what I mean? It's gonna, it's gonna have vibe. It comes with the broccoli, have some crispy garlic. I, I still remember it to this day. And then I remember the night after the dinner when we were all leaving, because I used to go to the bodega next door to get the sun-kissed candy, the little sun-kissed jellies. I always like expensive candy, too. That's how I knew I needed to make money to live out here <laughs> in these streets. Um, so so I, get the sun, I get the sun-kissed jellies, and on our way to the bodega, she's like, yo, that was such a delicious meal. She was, you're a remarkable, more, a remarkable boy. And I remember, like, some spit fr- coming from her mouth on my face, but I was just, <laughs> I still remember, like, it was yesterday. You know, she's older. She's probably in her 80s. And just having that affirmation that came from outside the ha- household, because, you know, your parents are supposed to tell you you can do any, everything. So you, <laughs> you, you might believe it a little less. But when this older woman that's a stranger told for something that nobody told me to tell her this, right? Like, I gave her this information on my own, and she was just really, like, flabbergasted by it and was telling me how remarkable I was. I was like, word. And I just kind of went through that energy for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, and then and then with the hustle game, like I excelled so crazy with so many odds against me in the hustle game. In business, I really feel like I could do anything because the stakes are lower. Like before the stakes was getting my head blown off, having my family hurt, people kicking in my door, cops, life in jail. Now it's like, what? You lose some money, try again, like whatever. Like it, it's... It's the stakes are so low, you know. It's just a different, a different. I'm playing with house money, so. Uh. I love you, John. I love you <laughs> so much. Um, everybody needs a friend like John Gray um, because he keeps it so real. But this is what I wanted to. What, what are the best lessons that the street has taught you? And I'm asking because, you know, I'm coming from the suburbs of St. Louis, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I came to New York mad green, mad weak, um, and frail. I believed all the stories that they said about America and its history. And you, you knew, right, like firsthand a completely different way in which the world could work. Um, so what are those lessons? And how have well, they helped you really, you know, kind of push well, through? Well, I... I'll- I'll start by saying this, like even my adaptation to the streets was a challenge, right? Because I came from a great Mm. family background. Single parent, so like I did lack that male kind of perspective or point of view, which is why I probably drifted and my ADHD led me to not always get the best behavioral marks in school, which they listed me as like a bad, they they just put you in a pile of, oh, he's one of those, but I was very intelligent. but just I just wanted to talk shit and swallow spit with the homies after I did my work. But um, from the streets, the big lessons, I think for me, the thing that stays with me now is just the 15 second gut test, right? Because you have to be able to feel somebody's intention for you within like 10 to 20 seconds or else that mm. could mean that could be your life. And, and that could be your life in terms it could be a confidential informant coming to buy something for you that's actually a police or a fed or it could be somebody coming to harm you or take from you. So you kind of got to, it's like that, hmm, like, like, who are you? You know, so that's like the most poignant thing that I'm grateful for. So like, I know if I fuck with you or if I fuck with an idea, very quick. 
And you'll probably see that. Like, if I fuck with you, I embrace you quickly. And it's like, whatever you need, like, we can rock. But if it's, it's going to be hard to penetrate if I, if you don't pass that 10 to 15 seconds. It's like, it's like a, it's like a very long stick. Like, like you might have to get to me through a few other people. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so that's like the most poignant um, thing that resonates, but also the importance of perseverance. Cause it's like, I remember hustling on the block, like when I, when I first started, like, cause I came in the game, I never worked for anybody. So I had to really learn everything on my own. Where most 15 year olds that started like me or started at my age, they had somebody that they were moving packs for. I never was an employee. Um, but for me, it was, it, it's just like staying true and fi- if everybody's doing the same thing, like everybody was selling the same garbage weed on my block, nickel bags, I had to find another block. I went to City Island, you know, I went out there there to go fuck with the white boys and, you know, that was doing keg stands and I could sell a nickel bag for 10 and whatever, like, and it was just a different level of tension too. Like it wasn't as tense, it didn't feel as dangerous, right? Um, although it's a different type of danger with the racism that I experienced out there. I'm mm. like, shit going down. And you stick out like a sore thumb when you're like the black kid that's not, that's at City Island when it's not peak season. Cause City Island's like the hood Hamptons. When I saw it, we went from the Hamptons last weekend to City Island to eat after a friend's brunch. But but yeah, th- those are the things. It's like, it's really just, if it's not working, like try something different, but you don't, you don't, you don't gotta, you don't gotta give up. And also customer service, like ser- being a stand up human is the most imp- important thing. Like if, if you if you do what you say, you know people remember that for ten years. And if you can't do something, just say you can't do it. You know because everything can't be done, and it's not for you to do. So don't mm. like, don't don't get thrown off your course trying to trying to be something you're not for something that you think is going to help you out. And also that nobody, it's not one person that could make you successful. It's it's. It's the daily devotion that you have to the small task that kind of bend the universe in your favor. You know, it's 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 that. It's like it's the equation. Like if you do the work, like the opportunities are going to show up. You just have to stay diligent and do the work. Like I did so much work in, in the fashion business in the fashion game, and people always knew I was ahead of my time with that, right? And people people knew that I, the stuff was cool and that I was I was going to hustle. Like I wasn't. I wasn't too above hustling. Like I'm, I'm taking shirts out the trunk. Like yo, here, like, like what's up? Like yeah, we in Bergdorf. I still got that work in the trunk. Like so, so, so that was that was that was the essential essential learnings. Like it's just a certain, and I'm still like that. Like people are like, hey, you did a TED talk. Like you still giving t-shirts out. I'm like, yeah, nah, hey, I'm gonna still tell you to go go pre-order my book. Like I'm not I'm not too cool to to do that you know it's like let's let's get it it's it's, yeah so so it's just being being true to who you are i think that's that's what i'm learning i call it being sturdy sturdy and worthy just Mm. stay grounded in your truth and and live in your truth and and it'll work out and success is different for anybody for everybody like material success isn't really the true definition of success yeah you might be more comfortable but it's also one of the most depressing times in my life was when I got some material success or when I hit a goal because when you're coming from a, a situation where you don't have much or you think money is the band-aid or money is the goal that fixes everything, right? When you And then when you get a little bit and you're like, fuck, I still have voids and things that need to be worked out, it's like a triple down effect on the, on the, it's like, oh, hold up, I believe this my whole life, like I was working towards this and then I got this and that, and then I still feel a void. So mm. I think I think it's just true to stay true. I know that doesn't answer your question about what did I learn from the streets, but that's just something I've learned in this journey. Like, stay stay centered, stay grounded, stay stay surrounded by love, you know, and and make sure what you're doing is meaningful, and not not just to the world because you could be doing things that like you get all the adoration, people think it's amazing, but if you're looking at yourself in the mirror and not feeling fulfilled or feeling voids, like address those things, you know? Oh, no, no, no. You more than answered the question. It was actually extra credit. You, <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. you, you, there were some beautiful gyms. I hope, I hope y'all listening took some notes there. John spoke some real universal truths there, you know, how to bend the universe 
in your favor. Um, you know, speaking of like even the, you know, and thank you for mentioning like even the challenges you had, right? Like coming into the streets, like, you know, you speak a lot about your mother um, and your grandmother and the things that they instilled in you. Um, you mentioned even some art. I mean, I'm looking at you now, you have art in um, in your space. Where, when, when did that art integration come in? Because, you know, you spoke earlier about Ghetto Gastro being this real cultural space, but like, where did that art love and desire come from? And why art? What well, is art I'll tell you, you two, I'll tell you two stories, right? So I didn't really realize this until maybe in the last three or four months. But it's like, like I mentioned, like growing up with that, like I didn't give credit for the black art I grew up around, even if it came from 125th Street or the Gullah Islands in, 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 in Charleston, South Carolina. Like I grew up with black imagery on the walls of my family members' houses. Mm. And that was like the norm for me. And I don't think I had an appreciation for that until recently when I was like, oh, wait, that's, that's, that was exceptional. That wasn't like what happens. That's just not it. Like, you know? Um, and I didn't even think about that. Or like like my mother was doing hair at John Atkinson Salon, which was like the premier black black hairstylist in New York City at the time. She like she did Michael Jackson's hair and Lenny Kravitz's hair back in the days when he was like Romeo Blue or some shit like that. But um and I ran into Lenny in Paris and was like, yo, my mom used to do your hair. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, What? Hold up, Denise, what? Like, like, like in the eighties and shit, he was like, Yo, that's crazy. So so that was that was that was super dope. But to, 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 to take my current journey in art started from a place of anger. So a buddy of mine, mm. Todd Merrill, I was in Puerto Rico on a business trip, right? Um, meeting one of my friends, Keisha, who runs like now runs. She was a mentor of mine. At, at, she was a business student at, at Columbia Business School at the time. And it was a conference in, in um, Puerto Rico. She said I should come. And I was like, all right, boom. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a yes person. I'm like, oh, where? All right, boom. I'm going to pull up. Because I learned from doing like I learned from like I like I pick up the game like even downtown like I never was a downtown kid but I was out on bail and my cousin Jay Murder with Nemo Labrizzi brought me to La Esquina and it just opened up a portal to this La Esquina in 2007 when you're talking you walking in Jay Z Madonna like not a lot of not a lot of brothers or sisters in there and I'm just looking and I'm like this is something different that I've never seen before I need to take this shit over like I need to figure out how to make this my domain and I did that quickly and then that led to the fashion thing helping bubble because the PR girls when they needed to make a reservation for their client and they they could never get a reservation at live skin they they called me and I put it under my name so then the name just started buzzing away like people like what's this I've been to John, um live skin five times and every time the table was under John Gray but I, who is this enigmatic figure but so in this going to live skin I met this white dude Todd Merrill at, at La Esquina, and he probably just thought I was an artist or something because I was a, black in La Esquina. You know how that goes. And and he and he's like, what do you, and then he's like, he has a gallery. I'm like, a gallery, what, like art? And he was doing mid-century modern furniture. So he's at Art Basel 2008. Um, I'm in Puerto Rico. He's like, yo, you in Puerto Rico? Just stop by, stop by um, Miami. There's this art thing going on, Art Basel and Design Miami. And I'm like, what? But again, me being a yes person, I say yes. I pull up, and it was a little shorty down there I wanted to meet that I was trying to link with, and it gave me an excuse to to catch up with her. So I go, I go to, I go to Miami, and um, I get a room. Uh, I'm, Jamal's down there too. Jamal's down there too. So um, we're, Jamel, my bad. Jamel's down there too. So we were like both early, and Larry too. I didn't know Larry at this time though. So. I go, I go to um, La Esquina. I mean, I go to Miami, and then um, so Todd, his 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 childhood friend, is dating the CEO of Puma, and Puma um, sponsored this exhibition at the Rubel, was it the Rubel Gallery at the time? It wasn't the Rubel Museum. It was like the Rubel Gallery, Rubel Collection is what they called it. And it's a show called 30 Americans. And it has some names you might recognize. Micheline Thomas, Kehinde Wiley, Rasheed Johnson, Nina, Chanel, um, Hank Willis, like all like the greats. Like, like, and I go to this show 
but I'm the only black person in the audience that didn't make a picture that's hanging on a wall. Yeah. And this is like the pre- this is like the preview and shit. And I'm like, how do these people get to own this? Like, like why? Mm. Like, and and for me, it just presented an issue in my mind, and it was another live skin moment. It was like, ah man, it's 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 black value being created that I don't feel like is being captured, like by us, you know. So I just was like, yeah, I'm going a, I'm to a learn this shit. I'm going to learn this shit. And I remember seeing Larry a few months later at Soul how CeCe introduced us. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I seen you. I, it was like, yeah, I seen you. And I was like, yeah, what are some books to read on the art game? And he get, he suggested some books. And then we started going to open studios. And for me, I just love black creativity and I'm a creative. Like I thought at first I was more of a business person, but when I started getting into business, I quickly learned I'm way more of a creative person. You know, that just happen knows how to how to how to happens to know how to secure the bag. But but I'm way more right brain than left brain. And just building with artists like artists, architects, scientists yeah. are some of my favorite people to just be in community with because the level of ideation and, and you know, not to be selfish, but what I get pulled and what I get gained from those interactions just on a spiritual like level just brings me up. So I just I, I saw like black art as the way black wealth was leaving the black community. And it's like, yeah, I, wow. I have this thought, like every artist gets a brownstone. Like, yeah, the artist making the work that achieves success in the market, like, yeah, they get a brownstone or they get a house upstate. But then it's like, what about the community? And then Derek had a point at the thing we, the black assembly we did at the Hamptons the other day, like, yeah, some black artists should just be able to enjoy their life and, and just make money in it. But I honestly feel like as black people, that's sometimes a privilege that we don't have in this lifetime. <laughs> like, you know, it's like we, for me at least, it's like, it's about paying it forward, right? Like it, it's it's really about liberation in a real way and like using every tool at our disposal to, to get that. But I also know it ain't for everybody and it's mm-hmm. levels to this. Like, just like in the streets, everybody can't be a brick seller. Every, some, you have bodegas, you have Walmart. It's like, it's levels to this. Like everybody's selling food, but it's just like, it's different, you know? And and people, different people have different convictions based on their experience. Like me, even coming into the art game, when you think about the respectability politics, even with a name like Ghetto Gastro, some black folks ain't jacking that. They like, mm. and, they, and, and some people went to prep schools and like, I represent what they fear, even if they're black, you know? Like they're like, before I open my mouth, if they just see me or they don't know who I am, who I am, or whatever that I did a TED talk, they like, it, it, it's like, you know, mm-hmm. this weird energy. Mm-hmm. So we also, that's also some work we need to do within our with our own communities. It's just like, let, let's give each other the benefit of the doubt. And also let's not think that this white gaze or this white thing is the goal. Like, like it, it's, it's, I'm not trying to really replicate what the colonizers have done. I'm really trying to do it in a different way, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I, I just need to go back really quickly. Um, a little bit of, like, encyclopedia for people because you blew through some names. So I'm going to just lay them out. So okay. one name early is CC is Carolyn Concepcion, who is an incredible quiet friend in New York City involved in the worlds of art and design and culture uh, was really pivotal in the expansion of Solange's St. Huron brand above many other things. Um, You mentioned Jamel, uh, who you saw uh, down at an art museum, or, or sorry, at an art fair, and I'm assuming this is Jamel Robinson, um, yeah, the artist. Yeah. Uh, you also mentioned a person named Larry, whose full name is Larry Osai Mensa, who is the curator du jour of uh, our time. Uh, incredible, incredible, turning so many people on to incredible black artists and has created um, and founded an organization with CC Carolyn Concepcion, um, called Art Noir. Um, and w- I feel like there might have been another name that I missed. Um, I do, damn, I do. No, I think that those those are the important ones. Oh, and you and said that, Derek. Um, who oh, is Derek Adams, who Derek is Adams, an incredible yeah. uh, artist as well, um, doing 
doing amazing work, just did a collaboration with Tiffany's. So for those listening, we'll put those in the show notes for you so you all can dig in uh, to those worlds. Um, but you also said something that I loved. It, 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 it's, it's, it's so much of your subversion is just walking in your truth. Right. And, and so much of your practice is the practice of subversion is, is the showing up. Right. You do it through uh, the way that you speak. Right. Like you don't code switch in spaces. Right. Um, you do it. You know, you mentioned your TED talk. And for those of you listening, you can just Google John Gray uh, TED talk. Um, it's incredible. But you show up on the TED stage, the world stage in your do rag, right? Like, <laughs> and not, not only like, is that you, right? Like the silk, you know, the silk, the silky, um, but you also understand what it means to show up in that space as that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned art and your desire just to out of built out of frustration, right? To learn the game and, you're now working with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Like you as an artist. You like, curated yeah. this an entire exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt, you know, Smithsonian Museum of Design um, in their select series, which was phenomenal. John, like what but what does it mean? What does it mean to subvert and show up as yourself in these spaces that are both institutional and also cultural, like with with your own people. Nah, it's it's crazy, and, and I did. I used to code switch, and, and I'll tell mm. you how my how my code switch was. It was like a reverse code switch. So, because like I said, I kind of grew up in in a mixed media situation. Whereas, like I went to the ninety second Street Y. My first friend was actually a um, Korean kid that was adopted by a Jewish family in Riverdale named Kobe. So it's like always been this multicultural. But when I was in, like, remember, I'll tell you, the streets wasn't my native, like, me selling drugs wasn't, like, the native path for me. Like, yeah, I was getting Mm. in trouble and doing things. But so when I came to the streets, because I had information and I had access areas that a lot of my comrades didn't, I purposely, like when I was on a block, we talking about intellectual stuff mm-hmm. to show that like, yeah, this dude that's out here getting money, running shit is not just focused on drilling and all of the book. Like, it's like we having a different type of conversation here. But then when I was in other company, I'll be on some, you know what I mean? Like, like that. Like, so it's like, yeah, also don't discount the brother that might look like me that speaks like this because they got something to offer and something to say. So it's like, I, I used to code, like opposite code switch and go mm. extra on both sides of the spectrum, depending on the environment. Now I'm just like, it is what it is. I am who I am. I know what I know. And But like as as a youth, because when I was hustling, I don't want to look like I was hustling. You wouldn't catch me in a do-rag when I had a brick on me. Like I was wearing mm. a Ralph Lauren purple label shirt. I drove an Audi. Like I buttoned my shirt all the way to the top. I wore a Tommy Trench, you know, jeans with je- khakis and shit. Like, 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 even when I was in middle school, like, because I got kicked out of Catholic school, I was my my uniform was like khakis, a Tommy shirt, and the cinnamon or the or the Tim. So I, I always had a little bit of a different like style than what every <laughs> everybody body else was, which was bridging the gap. But it's like prep street kind of thing. So, and that's just what it is. Like, I like I say, I walk. I'm on a I'm on a test stage doing a wearing a do rag and a gold Cuban link with my shirt rolled up so you can see my watch, but I'm also on a TED stage, right? And it, it so it's 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 like that that duality is I think what what makes what we do special and and us have to have the ability to really do it in a real way and to have because we just have respect in a lot of different fields, whether it's like if you go back to the 10, 20 years ago, like street legend status, whatever, that respectability, but that's good for the youth to connect when they're like, oh, this is someone that was about that life that could tell me that that's not the life to take. Like, cause mm-hmm. think about it. When like a dude used to come to the assembly when I was at elementary school, if I don't relate to them, I'm like, I can't, I'm like, you, you weren't the kid I was in school. So how can you tell me 
how to be versus mm-hmm. like I had trouble in school. I had trouble. In, I've had brushes with the law. Like I might have been arrested fifteen times, you know. Mm. But but like so, I could I could talk that talk and and be understood because I know what it is to to have similar thoughts that some of the people that are going through things now have. Yeah, where do you feel most safe? Shit, around us. Like when we were like so about a we did the Black Art Assembly at my boy Rich's crib two weeks ago. And then, you know, it was a Gucci party after, right? And no disrespect to Gucci or anybody, because y'all might be socking it to my pocket soon. But I just wanted to keep the palette black. I was like, I don't... I just want to... This moment that we had this day, I don't want to add another... I don't want to add another flavor to my palette. (laughs) And not, not to be like, to sound crazy or anything, but I just like... For us to be comfortable amongst each other, Mm. having ideas in a beautiful, lush environment, like, I feel like this is like... With the motherland shit, like this is like, this is our inherent right to just be free amongst each other, like eating well, like drinking well, having great conversation, comfortable, not feeling like we're the guest, right? Like, you know, Mm because sometimes you get invited some shit, it's two black people, it's like a affirmative action invite list. Like you're like, oh, so you just want to show that you're interesting and you know some black people. But like... That's not comfortable for me. Mm. So, so like the environment we was in, that's like that's like my bliss. Like, and I mm. and I just want to be able to cultivate that type of environment to be able to happen on a regular basis. Like, so I just feel great amongst amongst us because for a long time, like I was that only only one of the probably five young black people at Basel in two thousand eight, two thousand whatever. And I'm not the kid, like, because they give us the scarcity shit, like, where it's like, oh, no, it's only room for one. Like, you be the, mm. the black friend. I'm not the kid that just wants to be the black friend. I'm like, all right, if I'm the black friend. We kicking this door open. Everybody coming through. Like, we mobbing. Like, mm. like let's let's get it. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I truthfully, I want to I, I wanna be able to rent the yacht that all my friends come through. I want my friends to be able to rent the yacht. I don't want to just be the one brother on a yacht. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, and you you mentioned someone named Rich. Uh, he's referring to Richelieu Dennis, uh, the former, well, the founder of Shea Moisture, um, who now owns Essence Ventures, amongst other things. But for you, John, like, you know, it's interesting. I kind of want to take it back to to your niece. And this idea of, okay, so, you know, you all are listening, right? So you can hear John, but John physically is not a small person. (laughs) (laughs) John is also um, impactful uh, in his physical presence, um, but also, as you can hear and see, absolutely wonderful and kind and generous. Um, intimacy how do you find that how have you developed it and how are you working to be more vulnerable through therapy because i think um that that's one of the areas i want to grow because i feel like i'm very intelligent in terms of like books business just like life knowledge but my emotional intelligence has definitely been stunted by decisions, I think by how I was raised, like generational stuff, like my mother's connection with her mother, my grandmother had my mother very young and was in a, and her father was a pastor, so she might've felt some shame in that community, which, mm. which, which reflected how she raised my mom and their type of connection as p- parents and having intimacy there, and then how my mom raised me, and like, so, so it's, it's definitely some things to break through. But now my mom's in, that she's super soft and she wants to connect that way. But for me, and I think I also have some neuro, neuro, neurological things going on with the ADHD that could sometimes make empathy hard for me to access or sort to of like reach out and touch. Like even it was a moment with the conversation with my niece, I knew I should have got up and hug her, but I couldn't get up and hug her. Like, like mm. you know what I mean? Like I couldn't, like the thought came to me, like, oh, you could in this conversation with a hug and like, so she could feel, but I didn't do it, you know, you know, and even in my personal relationships that happened. So 
I think through therapy and through unpacking some of the things, because like I remember I stopped trusting people after like so-called friends of mine. I used to have the what would Jesus do keychain on, you put it around your neck so you didn't lose your keys. I remember like someone stealing my keys. I thought I lost them. They, these cats are helping me look for them shits everywhere. And then my my PlayStation ended up getting stolen that I didn't even get to play because I just got it. And you know when you're kidding, you're young and you're innocent and you're like, you're not bragging, but you're telling people, they're asking like what you got. you telling them and cats stole my PlayStation. I was like nine or 10. I, I It's been hard for me to trust people since then. So like, mm. and, and I unco- unlocked that in therapy. So I have a great therapist that Cece actually recommended me to. She called, and she'd been trying to get me in therapy for like six years. And it was just one day, um, I think it was last year or earlier this year, she just called me like, yo, nigga, do that. I'm like, you know, today's the day. I'm, I'm, I'm making an appointment now and I started, I, I haven't had a session in a while, but I felt like a better person. Like when I'm on top of my dean, when my dean is meditation, physical activity, like exercise and movement, and when I have therapy in the mix with that, I feel invincible. I feel like I'm floating and I'm really operating at a high level. It's like having a luxury car and putting mm. bad gas in it. If I'm not doing my, my my practices, I feel like I'm putting bad gas in the car. But when 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 I'm on point, it feels like high, it's high octane. You know, it's like all right, I'm moving at the frequency that I'm meant to move. But it takes work because all of those things. Like my thing is, do the shit you don't want to do when you wake up. That means make your bed, brush your teeth, do your push-ups. All of the things that you like, oh, I could do it later. Just do that shit right away. And then start off with some accomplishments, but but the intimacy is something I'm trying to unlock. Like, and it's it's a it's a challenge for me because it's not natural. And I could be like charming and and energetic in a, in a group setting or even on this podcast. But then when I finish and I'm next to my girlfriend, I might not have words. Like like you know, it's like I might. So it, 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 it's something I'm 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 working on. I'm working mm. on like. Because there's so many barriers. You know, people are like afraid to be heard of. I've been betrayed so many. And, and these are things like childhood trauma, not like recent shit. Like, it's like shit that the girl that the girl that teased you when you was young, you're like, hello, what? Like, like <laughs> so, so it's just like that shit that I'm trying to unpack, you know? Yeah, brother. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Even as you speak, you spoke about your niece and you're like, I could hug her and I didn't. Real shit. But, but that's the bridge because now you, because there is the option in your brain now. You mm-hmm. recognized that there was a moment, right? Whereas before, you may not, hugging wasn't even on the menu after something yeah, like it, that, right? Which means that the next time you will. Right, which, the conversation like, wouldn't have even been on the menu because, oh. like, she hit me with the, she, she hit me with the, can we, can we talk? And I'm like, even anytime, like anybody I dated, when they, you know, when a woman hits you with the, we got to talk shit, you like, mm. how long can I avoid this conversation? <laughs> you like trying to figure out <laughs> everything. Like, all right, well, <laughs> all right, she forgot about that. All right, good. But, but, and I'm like, what the fuck you want to talk about? Me being an elder, I'm like, I need you to tell me what you want to talk about. She's like, nah, let's just talk. And I'm like, begrudgingly, I'm like, all right. Went mm. to the room, we talked. And, and I was really glad we had that conversation because I'm like, damn, this 19-year-old just schooled me on some shit. Like, she just took me to, even though, like like I said, it was things in there that I had to give her some notes too. Like, all right, you saying you want this, but this behavior of you being in your room all day doesn't, that doesn't create room for interaction, you know? So, so, um, but yeah, like my girl looking at me probably like, you talk about this or the dr- Yeah, this is barrier. This is this is black imagination. I'm an open book, man. I'm gonna yeah. keep it a buck. So you ask the question, I'm gonna get a real answer. And we appreciate it, man. Like you know, as we kind of wrap things up, like I wanna get down to some like practical stuff because, you know, like you have built this really just beautiful space not even a brand but like a space for conversation um you know as 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 an individual wanting to collaborate with maybe their friends right like you have a good idea and you you and your you and your boys you and your ladies like want to do something like what's advice you would give for somebody who wants to start something and collaborate with their friends like and they want to build something just do it start 
What I've learned is if it's a business thing, try to have paperwork agreed on early or at least like start and see who's applying value. Cause it's easy to be like, let's split this this way and this way. And then you realize like, wait, I'm doing 90% of the work. And like, then you start resenting the business or your friends or the project. It's like get into a flow and kind of see what's mm. happening before you ink any, but then make sure you ink anything. Cause I've had issues where things weren't in black and white and then it ended up being a problem. You know, mm. transparency is key as well. You know, um, just being transparent with, and that's something that I haven't been perfect with, like being, but just being transparent. Cause when you know you're moving in good faith, I'm not the most communicative person. I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm moving honorably, but people just sometimes need transparency. Um, what else? So those are like super practical things and just, just do it. And like, don't, don't think that any one person could change, even though sometimes in reality, like, yeah, like if you sing for P Diddy or perform for P Diddy at a party, you might get signed like Mace did, but that's a strike. That's lightning striking in the bottle. And even before that happened, Mace was doing the work, freestyling everywhere and rapping everywhere for someone to have the opportunity for someone to be like, yo, Diddy, you should listen to this kid. When you do the work, the universe is going to catch up with you. So just do the work. And even if you're making mistakes or you're being hard on yourself or you expect to, like, this shit is not overnight. Mm-hmm. So make sure you also are fulfilled by the work. That mm-hmm. it's not just for a finite a finite goal, like a material goal, because that's going to be hard to... Some people win like that. For me, though, it's hard because the value of money has meant less to me as I've mm-hmm. gotten older. Like, Because before, I was like, I just want to be on the Forbes, like Jay-Z. Like, and then now I'm like, I've met some billionaires that are corny as fuck. So I'm like, I don't want to be a corny billionaire. So, so it's like, I want to do work that means something to me. Excuse me. With people that mean something, I want to work with people I love on things that I love. And also know that sometimes that's a privilege. I, I fucking face 10 to life to have that privilege because I was doing mm. work that I didn't love. Like, so sometimes you also have to do work that you don't love to be in a position to really make the thing that you love your focus, but always work on it. But sometimes you might mm-hmm. have to do the gig you don't want to gig to sec- secure a bag because everything ain't, sometimes it's a bad gig to get the bag. Like, even with Ghetto Gas Show, it's like, we a quarter million dollars are free. Like, right? If you a brand you call in, you got to pay because, like, you weren't on my radar to work with. So it's like, you calling me. So don't think it, don't don't act like you giving me a privilege to work with you. It's like, I was chilling, dog. Um, whereas if, what, what, when it's with the homies, it's like, all right, boom. You have something to value. I have something to value. We could trade it out. Oh, it's just off the strength. It's like, whatever. Like, this is what we, we is robbing her. We do that other shit for that price to offset the other things we do that is not about a dollar. So just also understand that everything just ain't about, like capital isn't the only currency or currency isn't the only capital. Mm, you know, mm, it's, mm. it's a lot of other things that add value and, and, and just be there for people and, and hope that they'll be there for you, but also give in the spirit of giving without just it being transactional and inspecting something. Because the universe is, it, it, it fixes it. It, it. it comes, it comes. Mm. You just gotta like, it's like when you don't think it's gonna work, that's when it's gonna work too. It's like like at that brink when you're like, ah, oh, I've been doing this. Fuck, this shit ain't. And and like I said, I'm giving you like, like contradicting things, but it's also about knowing if you've been doing something, like don't stop working, but maybe tweak something or maybe it's something else to work on. Like, but just just put the just put the energy out there because sometimes the the person you're trying to reach ain't feeling what you're doing, so you got to adjust what you're doing. So, so yeah, so yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's 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 hot. Like I think also like in this time, particularly in the last two years, and I'm sure you felt it. You know, being a person of color, there's so many people who are showing up and saying like, "I want to help." Like, how can I help? Like, what do you need? Right? And we've been in some some pretty. Um, incredible and like exclusive places together. Um, but, you know, for, for that individual, you know, shit, for me, what do, you, what, what do you say, right? You're working on a project. This person says, I want to help you. What do you need? What can I do, right? Like for, for, for people who are not used to declaring what they need, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes even having the money conversation I think is something that just culturally in America we just do not have like 
what do you do in that moment, right? Well, I think the problem, even before the moment, is that we're not prepared for the moment. Yeah. Like, j really do an audit and, and figure out what you need. Because there will be the time when that when that presents itself. But also just know, it's, it's no one side, it's no one way deal. So be aware of what the other people need that you're in the room with. Under, get an understanding of what their program is, because it's like, if I'm trying to sell you tomatoes, but you're trying to make lemonade, I'm selling you the wrong fruit. Mm -hmm. It's like, make, make sure, make sure that there's alignment, you know, and also see what the strings are, because there's always strings. It, 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 the bags don't just drop without without any type of strings. Like it's gonna be reporting. Like I know me. Like I'm not trying to report. Like it's just like yo, this is what I'm doing. Like so so that's why sometimes I'll be like, nah, I'm good. Like just I, I don't want another boss, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. that reporter could sometimes take up more work than the actual work, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So if you're not set up for that, and I know oftentimes in our communities, or at least me personally, being a creative. Like I, I'm not set up to for the forensic auditing and, and all of that. Uh, so it's like, yeah, if y'all want to get a bag, just know that the thing's gonna happen as it happens, and keep it pushing. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which I think me being how I am, and also it's it's unique. Some of these things are unique to probably me and how I move in the world. But us being in some of the rooms that we've been in together, me and you and I, Dario, I think, yeah, just knowing what you want to do and like knowing the steps. And, and what the specific partners could do to help get the point across. Because honestly, sometimes it's just an honor for them to be able to say that they're involved with our project. And that's enough. Yeah. You yeah. know, because that, that's also currency to their project. Like, yeah. we don't know where they're getting money from. Sometimes they might need to raise money and they need to be attached to something that's new and innovative. So it's like, it, it, it's always, it always leads to, to more. So just I think just, just being knowledgeable of what of the rooms you're in and also just really being clear on what you need yeah you know Cause, yeah. cause money's one thing but it ain't everything and all money ain't the right money like take smart money like so if you're if you're trying to work on something that's in the let's just say if you're trying to build a tech company you know maybe like an automotive unless it's Tesla but maybe someone that's building like combustion engines or not dealing with technology or that someone that prints paper and you're doing something in electronics, they might not be the best person to invest in you because you also want applied knowledge with the dollars. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the dollars are not enough. Sometimes you need people to have the relationships that can help you. All right, boom, now, you, now you're funded. Here's what you need to do. Boom, 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 boom. And the knowledge mm -hmm. is more valuable than sometimes the capital. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, even on my on my side and my journey, um, you know, I always just look at people as human beings first, you know, like outside of like some capital exchange or whatever exchange. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's always a relationship for me. You know, it's never it's never the ask. It's not about a transaction. It's about ultimately, do I like you? <laughs> And do Yo, you like me? That's like, the most you know important I mean? part. And I was going to say, like, I can't do business with someone. I like, like, it, we'll take it back to the fifteen second test. I don't care what you offering or what you saying. Like, if we can't break bread and just kick it, I'm good because, like, the way we live, we spend a lot of our time working. Like, we this is a weekend. Like, we're, we're working on a weekend, right? Right. And, and, and about to go do more work when we wrap this conversation. So it's like, you want to be in community with people that you actually enjoy. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm, we're not mm -hmm. like doing nine to fives that where we weekend warriors. It's, it's like, our life is our work. Yeah. You know, fortunate or unfortunate. Look at it however you want to look at it. So yeah, you got to spend time with people that you really fuck with and not genuinely fuck with you. Yeah, And that's going to be there because everybody wants to come when it's raining. But when it's the dry season, who's going to be there with you? Yeah. Like, who's going to be there to, 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 like, give you a pep talk to, like, you know what I mean? Because one of the things I learned early, too, from when I was hustling, my phone was ringing two times a minute. Once I caught that case, that phone stopped ringing when I couldn't be of service or when I, when I, when I didn't have 
what everybody needed, you know, at that moment. And it was so crazy that for like two years, I used to suffer from phantom vibrates and phantom rings where I always heard my phone ringing, but I go to my phone and it's not ringing. Just, that's just, just from the six years of just, my phone always, like when I, I'm not exaggerating when I say 10 minutes couldn't go by without my phone ringing like two or three times. That was the trap. So I used to, my I was wired to always feel or hear my shit ringing. And then it wasn't, when it wasn't like that also depressed me when I, when I like got caught up. So I've learned from having it, losing it, having it again. And it's like, nah, you got to really be around solid folks. And you're going to have a couple bad apples. Sometimes you got to learn. Like some people you think is solid might not be solid, but it's always about the human connection. Everything else is just by the way, mm. you know, by the way. But everybody in these spaces, when, when you're striving for something, you're most likely going to end up attracting people that are striving too. So with that human mm. exchange, it's going to be like, all right, let's build. Mm-hmm. And you either build or destroy. So you got to choose mm-hmm. one. Uh, well, John, like this has been been such an incredible conversation. Um, before we kind of get to the last couple of questions, I want to make sure that I give uh, some time for you to let us know where we can connect with you, where we can find things, where we can buy Black oh. Power Kitchen. You got knives. You got... Uh, <laughs> we got we got a lot we got a lot well, Where can wanna, we, where's, if, the, where's the repository if you want to shop with us because you know the game is to be sold not to be told go to ghettogastro.com <laughs> we got the book there we got all of the links for the pre-orders you want to support a black owned bookstore wherever you are we got reparations club in LA we got lit bar in New York City um, kitchen arts and letters globally for signed copies so that's 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 the vibe. Black Power Kitchen is the energy. All fourth quarter slaughter is big Black Power Kitchen. We got we got our Crux GG appliances at a Target near you. Go get that black owned air fryer, you know. And we're gonna have more drip drops coming, like merch, cool fashion joints. We got a lot of, it's our ten year anniversary, so we're gonna do a, be doing a whole bunch of ten year collabs from now until August of twenty three. So so yeah, just tune into that. It's gonna be it's gonna be a fun ride. Dope, so when is the book drop? October 18th. October 18th is the pub date, but go pre-order that so we can hit that New York Times bestseller. Tell a friend and tell a friend. Let the games begin. <laughs> and, what's, and what's your IG? We'll link it up in the show notes. At, but at, drop it. at Ghetto Gastro. G-H-E-T-T-O G-A-S-T-R-O. My personal page is Ghetto Gray. It ain't a lot going on there, but if you want to tap in, fuck with your boy. <laughs> Well, John, before I ask the last question, I just want to take this moment to acknowledge how you constantly give people a window into the game um, to not only lead with your heart in all spaces, um, but to show yourself fully from head to toe and even in those spaces that you maybe feel challenged right to show a level of intimacy um there is a vulnerability even even if the vulnerability is our vulnerability being projected onto you you know that's that's what those people are responding to when they see the name ghetto gastro and they went to Hampton University and they're like, I don't want to be associated with that. And so even in that, you give even black people the gift of themselves back, right? Just declaring yourself in places of power, um, you know. And so I just want to thank you and acknowledge you for that, for always keeping it real, always keeping it a buck. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and finding ways to create community in spaces that were decimated. You know, we didn't get to speak a lot about Robert Moses um, and design crimes um, and the ways in which, you know, the white imagination rips black communities apart. Um, And so in many ways, the work that you're doing, we're doing, we collectively must do is the work of restoration of the communities that have been ripped apart. And so on that front, I also want to thank you 
for that work. Um, but if you had everything at your behest, what is the world that you imagine for the future? You broke up a little bit in the beginning of the question. What did you say? If you had everything at your behest, right? You, oh, you, but... you control it. You control it. You, you got the levers. What is the world that you imagine for the future? Man, just a world of peace, love, and abundance because it's like Nas in that I rule the world with Lauren Hill. It's like there's enough for everybody. You know, there's so many tricks and it's like greed and these systems that have been created with people from cultures that don't have natural resources, you know? It's 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 all here for us. It's it's so crazy because even when I think about like my spiritual journey and micro dosing and plant medicine, it's like I had to reach a certain amount of status and understanding before I even knew that these things were an option where it's in the world. It's for, it's here for all of us. It's like, but it's like I had to go through so many portals and and and, and hit 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 status to, to be able to access these things. And that that came to me on one of my plant medicine journeys. It's like, yo, this shit is just here for us. So for us to be able to just exist in peace and in abundance, that that's what the dream would be for me, you know? Health and happiness. Uh, it's a goal. It's a goal. Uh, but it's, I, I'm also so aware of the human condition, and right? And, and war and violence is a part of the human condition. So... Figuring out, but if we can mitigate that and and, and and get around that, I think we'd be in great shape. Mm. Mm. Really, sorry, one last thing. What books are you reading right now? Uh, right now, I am not reading anything, but I want to read this book called My Grandma's, Hand, Grandma's Hands. Mm-hmm. Jose Parley gifted me that, and it's about like generational trauma and how it could be passed genetically. Mm. And then I'm just, I've just been listening to like podcasts about business lately. Um, I got, I got. Which podcast? Right, right now, this is my friend Allie Kane's podcast. She's a CPG entrepreneur. She has a podcast called, called In the Sauce. And then a lot of, a lot of drink champs. That's my leisure, drink champs, mm. Flatbush misdemeanors. Like I said, I like, I've been watching TV. I got to find a book to get back and forth. And I've been listening to this. I'll send you a link. The making of a great CEO. I'll send you that link when I when we get off. Um, that's that's the audio book I'm listening to right now. All right, amazing, Mr. Gray. An absolute. Thank you for making space. This is amazing. Pleasure. You absolute know pleasure. you inspire you inspire me a lot. And ah. The work, the imagination, like your steadfastness, and always just being solid and the beacon of light. Like I've never seen you with a bad attitude. You know, it's always. <laughs> good vibes it's also at least with me not with me <laughs> but it's all it's all it's, it's always it's always good vibes and good energy and keep pushing you know and and us being able to listen to each other talk about imagination and that's like one of the things that you know oftentimes we don't get to imagine right because we're in this survival mode right and you know i think i think most of our liberation is going to definitely lie within our imagination. That's part of the magic of being black. It's like they can't, the imagination has no bounds and the expression of said imagination resonates and reams through all of the obstacles that have been placed in front of us generationally for centuries. So it's something they can't stop, you know? So thank you for making a platform <laughs> and space to discuss these things. Ah, of course, John. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am, you know, honored, honored to even receive those words from you. Um, The feeling is absolutely mutual. Thank you. Have a beautiful afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us today. John's journey to finding himself and his calling is a blueprint for the art of becoming. This community is so important to us. Let us know your thoughts over on Instagram and Twitter at Black Imagination. We love to read those comments. And if you like what you heard, leave us a review wherever you're listening. 
be sure to check out this conversation and others at blackimagination.com or on our new YouTube channel, the Institute of Black Imagination. No matter the detours life takes you on, just know that you're always on the path to yourself. Stay curious and keep dreaming.